morning and welcome to Epiphany Lutheran Church. We're honored that you have chosen to spend a part of your Sunday morning with us. We know you will be inspired by the message of Jesus today and we hope that you'll be given something to take with you into this new week. Just a few announcements to highlight. Earlier this week our Return from Exile team conferred and made a decision that we will continue to offer online worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings at least through September 6th. We think this is a well-informed decision. We think it's a faithful decision and we certainly hope it is a decision that will keep all of us safe and healthy. As we are living in this period of exile, I want to mention again today uh, that we invite you to get connected to Epiphany's Ministries through Connect, which is an email we send out every Wednesday and Friday. If you're not receiving Connect, you can begin to receive it by simply emailing epiphany at epiphany-lutheran.com. Moms and dads, we want to encourage you to make your way to the youth worship page on Epiphany's website. You don't have to create it. It's right there for you and for your kids to be together, to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, and to enjoy that special time as families. This morning, our focus is going to be on what it means for us to live as unified followers of Jesus, to have one voice for the sake of the world, to be one people sharing his love with all of God's people everywhere. And so as we begin this morning focusing on that theme of unity, we invite you to join in singing the hymn, We All Are One in Mission.
The last verse of our hymn reinforces our theme of unity for the day. We all are one in mission. We all are one in call. Our varied gifts united by Christ, the Lord of all. As we continue focusing on our theme of unity, please join me in the prayer. God of unity, we thank you for our siblings in Christ at Epiphany and in other Christian communities throughout your world. In your creative genius, you have made all of us with different gifts to bring to your table, and your spirit of unity helps us appreciate and celebrate all of these gifts. Thank you for unifying us in the midst of beautiful, challenging, and hopeful diversity. Thank you for the many ways you teach us to follow the way of Jesus, who prayed that his followers would be unified in love for you and for the world. We pray for the church that bears the signs of your love for all people. We pray for a unified expression of your ministry for the world. We pray for kindness among our faith communities, even when we disagree with each other's theology or opinions. We pray for wisdom and insight to maintain unity without demanding uniformity, to celebrate our diversity instead of making it a cause for division, to claim that diversity as a part of your gracious gift to us. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We enjoy special music. We are all one in Christ, reminding us that we can praise Jesus and give voice to our faith in a variety of languages. By now, I hope that you have picked up on the fact that our focus for today is unity, and we are looking at unity from a variety of different perspectives. I think it's important to say right up front that being in a place of unity does not mean that we agree 
about every subject under the sun. During this pandemic, there are a lot of things about which we might disagree. There are a lot of things that we might see differently. Yet in the midst of that, as you'll see in just a moment, Scriptures are full of references inviting us to experience unity as followers of Jesus. Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in harmony. What a beautiful image. Romans 12, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I especially love it when Paul says, do not claim to be wiser than you are. Indeed, a spirit of humility during this COVID-19 time is something for which I think we all ought to pray, that God will give us a unifying spirit that is also a humble spirit. 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you but that you be unified and united in the same spirit and the same purpose. When Paul says that we might all be in agreement, that's not an easy thing that Paul is calling us to. I see it as aspirational and hopeful as something we might experience as unified followers of Jesus. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Indeed, our inclination as people is not to be unified. But the promise is that God's spirit is a unifying spirit. God's spirit is the thing that can bring us together even in the midst of our disagreements. And finally, Colossians. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues... Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So much of Scripture is aspirational, it's hopeful, it's the writer's intention and the writer's invitation to show us how God might have us live, to show us how God might bring us together as a unified voice following Jesus. I think it's a dramatic understatement to say that we are under a whole lot of stress. This pandemic is stressing us out in more ways than we can perhaps even imagine. There are difficult questions around work. Do we work from home? Is it safe to go into the city? There are questions around parenting. There are questions around the school year that's coming up. What are parents supposed to do? What are they not supposed to do? What do they do when people think they know better than parents who are trying to make these decisions? We are under an incredible amount of stress. Some folks here at Epiphany are feeling stressed because they'd like to come back to our sanctuary to worship and yet It can't happen just yet. This is a period of enormous stress, unspeakable stress. For some of us, the worst kind of stress we've ever experienced. My experience with my fellow human beings is that when we are 
under stress and when there are difficult issues that we know we need to tackle, difficult issues that we know we need to take a look at, it's so easy under stress to fall into this either or way of thinking. Either you're for me or you're against me. Either you agree with me or you disagree with me. And if you're not in the camp that I think you ought to be in, well, I think we know what that's all about. Either or thinking is a sign of stress. And if you find yourself falling into that, I would invite you to find a way to, to work through some of that stress, to take a walk, to pray, to talk to somebody you trust. When we are under stress, we lose the ability to think of things with a nuance, to realize that life is rarely either or, to recognize that life is always more complicated than a simple either or scenario. So, in the midst of this, you might say, okay, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? An either-or kind of thinking wants to put somebody that you agree with over here and somebody that you disagree with over here as if maybe they're evil and maybe they're not even in touch with God and what God wants for us. Ohio State or Michigan? That's an easy one here in Columbus. It's also an easy one if you're living in Ann Arbor. It's just a different either-or. Either you are an Ohio State fan or you're a Michigan fan, and good heavens, if you think you can be in the middle, well, you're not really the kind of fan that you ought to be. This is a good one. Actually, it's a difficult one. Are you liberal or are you conservative? You see, either or thinking makes it impossible to communicate. Because if you're a liberal, then you're way over here. And if you're uh, a conservative, you're way over here. And I'm not even sure we can talk to each other. That's what stress does. That's what this time has done to many of us as we try to figure this out. Are you somebody in support of the LGBTQ community? Or are you someone with a so-called traditional view of human sexuality? And that can be divisive as well. If you don't see the world the way that I do, there it is. There is that either or. There is that stress that makes it very difficult for us to see life as it is, which is nuanced, which is the messy middle. It is rarely either or. Under stress under either or, under this or that kind of thinking, it is easy to look at another human being, even another follower of Jesus, and to paint them as the enemy. In fact, we have either or thinkers in our country today that want us to come to the place that we think we have to assign the role of enemy to somebody with whom we disagree. Talk about either or thinking. Talk about a lack of nuance. It's easy for me to point to somebody and say, that person is my enemy because they don't see the world that I, the way that I do and I'm just not sure we can even be in a relationship. Communicating during a crisis is certainly something that we have been trying to learn during COVID-19 time as we've been under stress as we have fallen into either or thinking, as we have lost the ability to see the nuances of life, as we have forgotten that life really is lived in that messy middle place, but we're trying. I love this, I saw this earlier this week. Texting is a brilliant way to miscommunicate how you feel and misinterpret what other people mean. Here's a couple of playful. Who's this? Why? Are you a boy or a girl? I'm a grill. What's your name? George Foreman. I thought you were a girl. No, I'm a grill. Oh. Texting can be a, a less than exact kind of communication and can be discouraging and, and uh tough to understand. How about this one? 
You left your phone at home. Well, there's, there's the text. How about this one, Mom? What was I born? Pretty sure you were a boy. Time. Oh, 1059, I think. Ugh. You see, when we're not together, when we're not person to person, how we communicate with each other can be confusing, and even messages that we don't want to communicate get communicated, and those that we want to get communicated don't. Communicating during this time is pretty challenging. And then there's always email. Sometimes we get a message on email and we think somebody is screaming at us when in fact they're just trying to communicate any old message. And so texting and emailing are inexact ways of communicating and can set off some pretty amazing misunderstandings and even hurt feelings. And then of course there's Facebook. Apologies to the guy I hit in the face with my crust. I will never discard my bread from my car window again, although the chances of someone having their window open, driving the opposite way at around 30 miles per hour, and being hit in the face is a one in a million shot, so you kind of won the lottery. Now, this is kind of a playful example of what can happen with Facebook, but we put images out there, we put messages out there, and it's incredible. In fact, I've had the experience during this time of stress in this time of either or thinking, I've had an experience of somebody looking at one word that I included in a Facebook post and it set them off. I wish I could have been in person to kind of talk with her about what all of this meant. So communication when we're not able to be together can be fairly tricky and of course there's Twitter as a kid, I remember going to the doctor and he said to me, how's your stool? I patiently told him that we had chairs and they were all fine. How we communicate in this inexact kind of way can be complicated and can send messages that we don't even want to send. And of course, the emojis. I don't know about you. <laughs> Maybe it's my age. I don't know about you, but emojis to me are very confusing. I'm always worried that I'm going to send the wrong one that's going to give the wrong message. So basically, I do a smiley face and maybe a couple of tears of laughter when, when something seems funny and maybe a tear when something seems sad. That's about all I'm willing to do. But there are people who have the emoji communication piece down altogether. But again, this could be confusing and even offensive and maybe something else if you don't get exactly the right emoji. I like this one. Wear a mask. It's as simple as that. But all of this is a way of saying that I think we need to give each other a break in the midst of this either or very stressful time when it's hard to communicate under the best of circumstances. Mentioned parents mention the struggles that they're having. And what I hear in the midst of all of this stress, what I hear too often are people who think they know what they need to do to coach parents to make the right decision. I was talking with some folks earlier this week and the stress has to be unimaginable for moms and dads and grandparents and guardians. What to do? Do the virtual academy? Do the hybrid? What to do? Impossible situations for lots of people who want to do the best thing, the loving thing, and the responsible thing. I think when we're trying to understand each other, whether we're using Facebook or Twitter or email or texting and things don't quite make sense, and parents don't quite know what to do, let's give each other a break. Let's give each other the time to be able to be uncertain. And let's listen well rather than trying to think that we know exactly what somebody else needs to do. Give parents a break. They're trying to do the best they can. 
Give bosses the break who are trying to do the best they can. Give yourself a break as you're trying to figure out how to live in this COVID-19 time. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. You will rarely hear me quote the King James Version of the Bible, but I love the King James Version of this passage. And now abideth, isn't that a great King James word? And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. In most other translations of this passage, it says faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. I love the King James Version because it invites us to be charitable in our relationships with one another. It invites us to express charity in our relationships with one another in an either or, either you're for me or against me world, Paul invites us to be charitable, which is to live in the middle. To be charitable, which is to say, I don't have all of the right answers and and neither do you, but together we might make sense of it. The greatest of these is charity. I really think that charity might be the most important gift we can give to each other during this pandemic. I really think that charity could be the thing that could allow us to move to a place of unity even if we don't agree about all of the issues. You know what they are. But to find a way to see and experience the things you have in common with the people you know the best and even people you don't know well and to be charitable. I love the King James Version. Faith, hope, and charity. Certainly we can find a way to express that. This past week we remembered the life of John Lewis, and John Lewis was one of the early civil rights leaders in the 50s and 60s. You might remember that John Lewis was friends with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., with the Reverend J.T. Vivian, with other pastors who were leading this movement as an expression of following Jesus. You might remember the Edmund Pettus Bridge and Lewis and the others going across and uh, being beaten up by the state troopers there in Selma, Alabama. You might remember all of that. You might remember that John Lewis was a charitable person, never raised a hand, even as he was being beaten and even as he was bleeding. A commitment to to nonviolence. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a commitment to nonviolent language during this time? Wouldn't it be great if we could have a commitment to nonviolent relationships during this time? Nonviolence, charitable, caring, and loving. And John Lewis was a small man, only 20 some years old when all of this began. And it was simply because he and others wanted people to have a right to vote. And so they gave their lives in this cause. And it was a Christian cause. It was a Jesus cause. Just before he died, Lewis penned these words. While my time here has now come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. Millions of people motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of division. Around the country and the world, you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. I love what he says 
you used your power to make a difference in our society. The best kind of power is charitable power. The best kind of power is the power of love. The best kind of power is the power of understanding. The best kind of power is the power of unity, not because we agree on everything, but because we know that Jesus wants us to live in a spirit of unity and to find a way forward. Paul says in Ephesians 4, but speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love. All right, I happen to see things this way and you happen to see things that way. Is there a way that we can disagree but be agreeable in the way that we disagree? Can we speak the truth in love, which means it's okay for me to have my thoughts. It's okay for you to have your thoughts. Speaking the truth in love invites us to get beyond, though, all of our biases and to see a greater truth. We must grow up in every way, says Paul, into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The body's growth, building itself up in love. Here we are, COVID-19 time, a pandemic. It's very stressful. It's stressful for parents trying to make the best decision for their kids, even when their neighbors make a different decision. It's a stressful time for people who are trying to figure out what it means for them to keep their job and are they willing to take a particular risk in order to do that. It's a stressful time for families trying to figure out how in the world we are going to make it. During this time of the temptation of either or thinking, without seeing the muddy middle. During this time, Jesus invites us to find a unified voice, to find a way of coming together and sharing in our witness in Jesus' name in a way that can heal some of the divisions, in a way that can bring people to a, a fuller and a unifying understanding of what it is to be disciples of Jesus. This week, I pray for you and for me to have a sense of faith, hope, and charity. This week, I hope for you and for myself that we can give people around us a break. I hope this week that for you and for me, we can pray for a sense of unity and humility. And when we do that, we know the Spirit can bring us together. I want to acknowledge it's a hard time. Yet God's charity and God's spirit will hold us together, will keep us together as a body of believers. Amen. i
We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. We believe. As we join together in the prayer of the faithful this morning, I invite you to find a prayer posture that you're comfortable with. You might place your hands palms up as a sign of giving and also receiving from God. You might like to fold your hands and bow your head and close your eyes as a way of focusing on your prayers. You might like to sit straight up and Look around the place in which you find yourself. If you have windows, you might look outside and take in the grandeur of God's creation. However you are most comfortable, please join me in this time of prayer. Gracious God, as we continue to live in this difficult time, Give us hope, hope that we are not alone, hope that you have not abandoned us, hope that you are guiding us, and that this pandemic does not have the final word. God, today we pray for all who are involved in the important work of education. We pray today for administrators of all kinds, for teachers, for parents, for kids. We pray for students in preschool, elementary school, middle school, junior high school, high school, college, grad school. And we ask that you will keep all who are involved in this endeavor safe and healthy and give wisdom in the midst of difficult situations in which decisions have to be made. And we pray that they will be guided by your wisdom. Today we pray especially for the Epiphany Lutheran Church Preschool and our director, Heidi Stover. Be with Heidi and her teachers and the board as they make important decisions about this ministry of our congregation. And God, as we are in the midst of all of this, we ask that you will give wisdom, patience, understanding, integrity, and honesty to mayors and governors, to our president, to those who serve in Congress, to our neighbors who help lead us here in Pickerington. As we gather today, God, we are mindful of so many who are in need of your healing touch. We pray for all whose lives have been impacted by the COVID-19 virus. We pray for Kayla, for Michael, for the Schultz family, for Mary Jane Smith, Sandy McCloney, and the entire family as they grieve the death of Dean, for Ron Borton, Barb Kosicki, Linda Fickner, Terry Hinkle, Amanda and Henry, Karen Beck, Heather, Loring Bates, Tom Starkey, Linda McFerrin Williams, and others whose names we now mention either aloud or in the silence of our hearts.
Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. If you'd like to, I invite you to type in a sign of God's peace to all of those who are worshiping together this morning. Take a moment to do that. Take a moment to reach out. Take a moment to let people know that you're here and that you want to share God's peace. Please join me in prayer. Holy, mighty, unifying, and merciful God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, who prayed that his followers might be one, that they might be unified in their witness, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For centuries, followers of Jesus have prayed the prayer that he first taught his disciples. And so as one people, we join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. We know that it is God's spirit that draws us together, that makes us one. So we invite you to enjoy spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word.
Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word. It's when you speak and when you move and when you do what only you can do. It changes us. It changes what we see and what we seek. When you come in the room, when you do what only you can do it changes us it changes what we see and what we So today we've been talking about unity, but you know and I know that this idea of unity is not an easy thing. There are times when I look at somebody else and I see their perspective and I want to see it as different and maybe even want to judge it. Maybe you've got that same struggle too. So this week my invitation to us is to find things that you have in common with the people around you. Maybe even begin with your family, and then your neighbors, and then other people. Jesus invites us to a place of unity, and maybe it is as simple as finding some things we have in common with the people around us.
Parents, it may be the case that more than ever, you have the responsibility of passing the faith along to your kids. I encourage you today to go to our youth worship page, take a look at the, at the resources that are there, spend some time with your kids, help them to grow as disciples of Jesus, and you probably will too. I hope you have a great week and we look forward to welcoming you again next Sunday. Fiction